Do you think that sort of the overemphasis that's out there right now on sheer calories, calories in, calories out, which we, you and I both know enough to know that thermodynamics are important and it matters, but do you think that some of the sheer focus on that has led it so that people maybe don't see the forest through the trees with this? And they think, well, calories, it's just calories. That's gonna make up my tissues and we're not focusing on nutrient quality to a certain degree. I love this question. This is a perfect segue from my university education, which was calorie focused, yeah. you know, and I was in this big auditorium class and the professor, the first day he was talking about how, if you want to lose weight, you simply need to expend more calories than you take in. If you want to gain weight, it's the opposite. And if you want to stay in the same weight range that you are, then it's going to be kind of a match of the two. Sidebar, he was overweight, notably overweight. And he was a great, he was a smart guy, absolutely. And was the science that he was teaching working for him? And also for us as a people society-wide. And I know myself personally and so many people that I work with, we, we, we did that thing. You know, we, we went into the caloric management and we might've gotten some results. And some people do, let's not negate that calories matter. But for me, Whenever I hear about any kind of term like that, that is so like globally recognized, and yet there's a mismatch in how it's all happening, I ask, where did it come from? And I encourage people to start to ask, it's like a good mental ex exercise. And so in my last book, I went back in history and examined where the calorie came from, the phenomenon, because our ancestors were like, you know, when they're passing, you know, food around the campfire 5,000 years ago, they weren't asking, well, how many calories are in that? I'm trying to watch my weight. It wasn't a thing. People just ate food. And so calories actually entered the realm of science and physics. It had nothing to do with food at all. And Atwater was one of the early adopters in transitioning in into food because we have the Atwater system actually on a lot of packaged foods today. And by the way, these packaged foods, they're not using a bomb calorimeter and incinerating the food and finding out how many calories are in that food just as a heads up for everybody. It's an estimate. All these things are just estimates and it's based on some math from the Atwater system. But the question is, how did it really get into popular culture with nutrition? And it was a physician in the earlier part of the 1900s named Dr. Lulu Hunt Peters. All right, Dr. Lulu Hunt Peters. And she wrote one of the first dietary bestsellers. It, it took off like a rocket. And within those pages, she created a new framework of looking at food. And she essentially said, for example, I'm paraphrasing, you will no longer eat a slice of bread. You will eat 90 calories of bread. You'll no longer eat a piece of pie. You'll eat 200 calories of pie. She made this pivot mentally for our society to stop looking at food as food and all of its complexities, but to start to look at food in numbers. Another sidebar, she struggled with her weight, even through that process of being this kind of glorified. And we're seeing this also in our health so-called health eaters today as well. I have just launched my signature truffles with Thrive Market. So these are low sugar. In fact, they're actually keto friendly. They're sweetened with allulose, utilizing ethically sourced cacao, and also using hazelnut butter to give it a really well-rounded taste. So two different flavors. There is a hazelnut pecan crunch, which literally has a crunch to it. It's like velvety smooth, but then when you bite into it, you get the crunch in there as well. And a hazelnut mocha flavor for those that like that little coffee bite to it as well. So these things are completely low carb. There's only a tiny, tiny bit of sugar in them to begin with. The primary sweetener is allulose and everything else is ethically sourced. So I partnered it up with Thrive because We've worked on products together, but it was finally time for us to actually create a product that has the Tom Stelauer signature on it. So that link down below saves you 30% off your whole grocery order through Thrive Market, but you're more than welcome to apply that 30% off to these truffles as well, which are priced at 10.99, so they're not too bad to begin with, but then when you apply that 30%, it's even better. Plus, you get a free $60 gift whenever you sign up with Thrive Market as well. So that link is down below in the top line of the description underneath this video. You know. And we don't need to get too much into that, but you can see that there's often a mismatch of the people in the top offices in government. Now, with that being said, it did provide some value because we can start to look at the energy context of a food. And a bomb calorimeter incinerates the food and basically we're seeing how much water can be heated up as a result of incinerating that food. 
But here's another lead into this point, which is our bodies are not bomb calorimeters that completely incinerate a food. There are certain things that are digestible. There are certain things that are not. There are certain things that use more energy just to digest the food. Like our bodies are so complex in how they interact with food and start to get tunnel vision. And this one little um, umbrella idea about food is so, it's so deficient. That's a great word. It's just so deficient in the complexity of what food really is. And so how do we address this? We understand that, yes, we can use calories as a means of understanding food from one micro perspective. But today we have all of these epicaloric controllers that we've identified that actually control what calories do in our bodies. Because we know that calories interact with my body differently, from your body differently, from everybody else listening. And one of those, just to give folks a heads up, researchers at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine did some fascinating research and they found that there's a particular area of the brain that's determining downstream caloric interaction. And what they found was that this rapidly growing phenomenon called hypothalamic inflammation. So inflammation in our brain, so neuroinflammation, but specifically of the hypothalamus, which in many ways is kind of like our internal, internal thermostat is located there. HPA axis, a lot of folks who are into science have heard of this, this information superhighway. Your thyroid is along that axis. Your gonads are along that axis. But the hypo, hypothalamic inflammation they found was directly leading to increased belly fat and insulin resistance. And increased belly fat and insulin, insulin resistance was creating more inflammation in the hypothalamus. It's creating this vicious circle. And researchers at Yale found that if for some reason there's disruption in what's happening in the brain, in its communication, for example, brain inflammation, your brain could literally tell your gut to decrease or increase the absorption of calories from that meal. We're talking, these are top tier scientific institutes, all right? Yale isn't just, it isn't, you know, Florissant Community College, no disrespect. There's a community <laughs> college at my, in my state. These are top tier places, but people aren't hearing about this science that, wait, my perception, what's happening in my brain could influence how many calories I'm absorbing from my food? Yes, absolutely, absolutely can. And on top of that, one of the biggest fields right now that's just growing so rapidly, and I'm grateful for this, but we don't wanna get tunnel vision on this as well, but the microbiome is having a moment right now, for sure. And researchers at the Wiseman Institute identified that certain bacteria, clearly, if people have a higher ratio of these categories of bacteria, Firmicutes in particular, you are going to absorb more calories from your food than your identical twin. So literally, look, you can't get any more similar than that. But looking at identical twin studies, and this was compiled by researchers at St. Louis University, another shout out to my hometown, um, but this huge database of identical twins, again, finding that if they have a higher ratio of firmicutes uh, compared to you know, bacterial DDs or bacterial roides, these folks that have high, by the, I'm thinking about firmicutes, just something to remember that I heard from my friend, uh, Alan Christensen, Dr. Al Dr. Al Alan Christensen, he said that if you want to be firm and cute, you want to avoid having too many firm and cute. It's funny, the way I've always remembered it is just very similar. I've just remembered like fat is not firm. Fat is not firm. That's just how I've just See like- See the little mnemonics, say, back, man. Back to and firm and cute, it's like, it's so easy to flip flop them too. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm yeah. not a microbiologist, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. These, just these little cool things, but we start to understand these are just two broad categories of bacteria, by the way but having a higher ratio of these bacteria. So what the researchers at Wiseman Institute, by the way, here's what they found. So this was crazy. They found that by altering the microbiome of laboratory animals, of these mice, they could substantially increase their caloric assimilation and make the mice gain weight, even eating the same diet, all right? And here's the crazy part. How they did this was taking bacteria from humans and adding, putting them into the mice. So they disrupted the human sleep cycle, all right? So they basically you know, put them through multiple time zone change and they seen a, a change start to happen in their bacteria ratios that more was correlated with people who had in insulin resistance and obesity just by their sleep being disrupted temporarily. And put this into mice and it made the mice gain more weight. All right, crazy stuff, but they could do the opposite. So people who had a lean, what they call quote, lean bacteria makeup, added to the mice, eating the same diet, the mice gained less weight. All right, so 
our bacteria have a huge influence. It's another epicaloric controller, right? So we've got our brain as an epicaloric controller. We've got bacteria being an epicaloric controller. We've got the makeup of the food itself being an epicaloric controller because the protein fraction versus carbs versus fats, your body is going to, you mentioned the thermogenic nature of food. It's going to metabolize food. Certain foods are more expensive calorically to process. Protein is, is that category. And part of the reason, it is, it is necessarily because protein is harder to digest. Based on, I've been in this field for 21 years. Based on the majority of data and also just a little bit of logic, I feel that that energy focus on protein is because protein is so valuable. I mentioned earlier, it's, you, if we're going to have hormones, if t whether it's testosterone, whether it's insulin, whatever, we need protein building blocks to make any of that stuff. Your body takes it seriously. When it can get its hands on some high quality protein, it's gonna do everything it can, extract every little bit of that because it's, ma it's making so much stuff. Last piece with that, and I'm just going back to university biology class, DNA to RNA to proteins. DNA to RNA to protein. When I see you, I'm seeing the protein you've eaten, predominantly. Of course, the minerals are in the mix there, but it's mainly proteins. Proteins are the ultimate kind of copies that are getting printed of us. Now, the cool thing where we're at today is that we know about, I mentioned epicaloric, epigenetics. And one of my mentors, Dr. Bruce Lipton, who really helped to impress upon popular culture epigenetics, he shared with me that, and this was years ago, and now we're just now catching <coughs> up to this. He shared with me that depending on the environmental input, whether it's a food, nutrigenomics, nutrigenetics, a food can alter the gene expression, the proteins that are getting printed there can be 3,000 different variations from one bite of food. This is how we're so diverse. It isn't because we have a lot of different genes. Human Genome Project, we've got like 20, 25,000 genes. There's corn that has more genes than us. Real talk. We're so different because of epigenetics. Our potential to be so much, so many different things is so powerful because unlike any other species, Humans, we're not just a product of our environment, we can create our environment. And last little bit here, one of the things he always kept referring me back to, even when I get ahead of myself with nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics and just like, because I'm so obsessed with food at the time, he's like, Sean, it's the mind first. It's always the mind first. Because your mind alters your chemistry instantaneously. And your perception, even of the food that you're eating, is going to determine the effects that it has on your body. And one of the coolest studies that affirms this was done by Alia Crum and her, um, and her assistants at Stanford at the time. And they did the milkshake study. <laughs> that was a you know about one. this? Oh, yeah. yeah. And so they, they blended up a batch of milkshakes and all the milkshakes had the same amount in them, same amount of calories, but they slapped different labels on them. One was the quote, indulgent milkshake, high calorie milkshake. And we'll just say that all the milkshakes were 380 calories. Well, the high calorie indulgent milkshake they put a label of like 620 calories on there. Then they had the calorie sense of shake, right? Being sensible in your calories. They slapped the label on there and said, you know, this is 200 calories. And so after allowing, you know, giving out these different milkshakes, but they're the same amount to different test subjects, they found that people who consume the indulgent milkshake actually had a significantly higher increase in leptin, our satiety hormone, and a significant decrease in ghrelin like our glorified hunger hormone, they were more satisfied. Just based on their perception, they didn't have more than the other people. They just believed they did. The people who had the Sensi shake, the sensible milkshake, they, their ghrelin barely budged. It was as if they didn't have anything. So guess what's gonna happen? They're going to be hungry again soon after. This was all based on perception. And so truly the mind first, and being more mindful of our mind management because we're not, it's not just you are what you eat, it's you are what you think as well. well that makes me wonder if you know, you've got all this food out there that isn't, you and I know is not healthy, but by some random standard, some food marketer somewhere says, well, it's low sugar or low fat or something. So we're going to put healthy on it. Yeah. For someone that isn't familiar with the terrain, perhaps that's changing the environment, right? Yeah. You've got this 1,000 calorie frozen TV dinner, but somewhere slapped on it is healthy. And now, you know, if I gave that to 
let's say I've, I've got some loved ones in my family that are very overweight. If I gave that to them, they'd probably finish that and be like, oh, that didn't, that didn't satisfy me at all. Yeah. Like that, that dang healthy TV dinner, you know, give me a banquet meals one. Like let's, let's bring it to town. I'm like, well, actually you ate more calories in the banquet meals one. It just said healthy on it. So it makes me wonder, it's like, yes, there's our perception, but there's also a forced perception. Like, cause this environment is created.